internet audience, we're so glad you could join us on our midweek service as we come to you live from the Bethany First Baptist Church, 202 Noblewood in beautiful Cherry Hill subdivision, just three traffic lights from the AT&T Center. Amen. You can find us if you look for us. God bless you. Amen. Now we're here tonight to talk about the struggle for purity. I think there is more to the struggle that we've covered, and I want to be talking about the struggle for purity. We're going to go to Matthew 5 and 8, which is part of the Beatitudes. Everybody say the attitudes. Yeah. And the Beatitudes are attitudes that ought to be in every question. How do you like that? Amen? Yeah. Attitudes that ought to be in every Christian. And we're going to look at them. Blessed are. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And blessed means happy. But it doesn't mean just happy. Because if I was happy, I'd be happy for a little while. Blessed means divine happiness which endows you to be happy through, even through turmoil, <coughs> struggles, pitfalls, and persecutions. God has a happiness for you that is long-lasting. Amen? Amen. Let me, let me go to the Lord for it. Father, we thank you right now for the power and efficacy of your blessed word, that as we study it, we might open our hearts, be cleansed and consecrated, and be able to receive the truth that you have for us. We thank you, we love you, we adore you. We bless your name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was reminded, of course, this is the summertime, and I want to tell you a little story about candy. Everybody loves candy? Is that right? It's your favorite subject, isn't it? All right, candy. In the old days, when we were growing up, many times, years, many moons ago, I was telling my wife, it looked like the summer would come, and it'd take two years for the summer to pass. <laughs> Now that I'm grown, it don't look like it's here for two hours, right? Huh? And it's now time for school to be started. Yeah. But in the old lazy, hazy days of summer, we got out and back and we played and we played all kind of uh, things uh, creatively and played with the dirt and made in our garden. But one of the morning, the thing that breaks up the morning, our grandmother, our great grandma, would let us go across the street to the little store. How many of you remember the little store? Mm -hmm. Before that was mom, or that was little mom and pop stores before they ran out of business. But you go in there and had a whole little candy with them. Here we go. Here we go. All the candies you can think of. Pretty sparkling candy, and kicks and kisses, and all kinds of little things you can buy. But one of the things we learned to buy was called the Holloway Slowpoke. How many remember that? Somebody remember. Thank you. Somebody know what I'm talking about. It was a candy, of course, that was on a stick. And it was dark brown, brown, and it was sweet, but you couldn't eat it in five minutes. In fact, it would take you five hours to work on that baby. And so if you wanted some candy that would last, you got a slow book. Amen. Now, if you wanted the other stuff, you could buy all that stuff and eat it up in five, ten minutes. And somebody would still lick it on this little book when the cartoons came on. <laughs> somebody would go back. God wants to bless us like that slow book. Right. He wants to bless us continually in a continuing pattern, and he doesn't want us to have a quick start and then finish. He wants us to be steady, he wants us to keep going, and he wants to bless us. So blessed in this, uh, in this uh, wonderful story of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, is about the attitudes, attitudes that ought to be. And the Lord says blessed, and he just doesn't mean blessed, he means divine happiness. Now, I can laugh and be happy, but if God gave me something, I could be happy if you woke me up at 12 o'clock at midnight. I could think about the goodness of God, and it's like spontaneous combustion. In other words, I would get excited just thinking, but does God be good? Yes, God is good to me. Woke me up. Amen? Now, I may not like getting up at 12 midnight, but I'll tell you one thing. Get me, get me to the point where I'm fully awake, I'll praise God. Amen? And preachers get up at all hours of night anyway. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about the blessedness, the struggle for purity, and we start with blessed. And the Lord says in Matthew 5 and 8, blessed are divine happiness, long-lasting <coughs> happiness, for the what? Pure in what? Heart. Oh, pure in heart. Oh, heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall do what? So here is a great verse that we need to focus on and think about. Blessed are the pure in heart. What makes someone pure in heart? Anybody? 
What makes you pure in heart? Because you didn't, you didn't come here that way, did you? David said, create in me a what? Clean heart. Uh, and renew in me the right what? Spirit. So if he had to pray for that to come, it wasn't already with him. Behold, I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Why do we get pure in heart? How do we get a pure heart? Through God? What, what mechanism? And what else? Specifically. Praise him. Seeking him. I'm looking for a word that begins with that. Faith. Faith. You got to have faith in God. When you have faith in God, God does a lot of things. But remember, it's the mind that God is working on. It is the mind at all times. Satan is working on the mind. God's working on the mind. Is that right? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted, reckoned to him, as righteousness. And with the heart, man believeth unto what? Righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made. Man believeth unto salvation. So it is a powerful thing to take your mind and believe the truth of God and, and count on that truth, and then God delivers something in your hand as though it were there all the time. That's a powerful truth. Is that right? It's a powerful tool to take faith and believe God. I just got through plugging the first of our okra in our garden. We have okra in our garden. Don't steal my okra. Uh, and I took the first little okra here and, and plucked it off, and I was just as happy as a kid. I said, do you remember we put these little bitty seeds, those tiny black seeds in the ground, a little, few, a few little inches in the ground, covered them up, and then watered them. All of a sudden, that okra is growing. Look at the marvelous plant God has given us, and look at what God can do with a dead seed. Isn't that something? And he can do the same thing with a dead soul. Huh? He can raise them. He can do something with dry bones. He can take it and make them new again. Even question Ezekiel, can these bones live? A divine interrogation. Ezekiel said, I don't know. And he said, prophesy. And the Lord let those bones get up a great army. He took a seed the other day. We put in the soil, prayed over it, blessed it, watered it, did all the things we needed, and God did the rest. That's the way God wants to do your life. He wants to take the seed of thought and transform you from what you weren't to what you ought to be. Isn't that a miracle? That God can take a mind and a seed of a thought and create in you a clean heart and transform you in a way you never thought. In fact, everything on this planet almost begins with a seed. Because in the matter that you were born, you are an embryo inside your mother. And Isaiah said, or God said to Brother Jeremiah, I knew you before I placed you in your mother's womb. Is that right? I sanctified you and ordained you. So I had a purpose. I had a, you were a seed, but you had, we were going to come forth, germinate, and bring forth a beautiful, beautiful person that you would be. And that's what God wants to do with us. And that's why we have to struggle for purity. Purity is the absence of defilement. Say that. Purity is the absence of defilement. And when you defile yourself, you have sinned. Is that right? And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God committed his love and that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died. died for us. And if we believe in the cross and believe in a resurrected Savior, and believe that he got up on the third day. That's the seed of your transformation. That's your ticket to paradise. Just a belief. And it doesn't cost you anything. If you go get credit, they got to check out your mama's maiden name. Is that right? If you borrow money, they want to go back to the third generation. You want your firstborn child. But when you come to Christ, all he says is, you, if you believe, if you believe, you can receive. Do you believe? And that's the issue. And believing is holding on to God by faith. We get pure by the fact that we believe in Christ. And because he was pure, his, his pureness, his righteousness is given. The word is imputed. That's a big word. But it means if you believe in him, you get to put on a robe of righteousness. Amen. Amen. amen? amen. And when you put that robe on, God sees you in a way that he needs to see you. A way that covers your sins. You recall when Adam and Eve sinned. The first thing that they did was lose the Shekinah glory of God. Is that right? Yes. They were in the, in the garden. He was window shopping at the wrong store. Is that right? Yes. 
you went to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that was the forbidden tree. And that's where we today always are captured by what is forbidden. I call it, a, and someone also called it, a fascination with forbidden, with the forbidden. When somebody tells you, don't do something, you can't cross this line. And our, our nature and evil is, what will happen to me if I do? Is that right? And somebody has to get their brains knocked out for you to believe you shouldn't cross that line. Is that right? Folks used to say, oh, folks, they used to say your head is hard. Is that right? What did they mean? That it's going to take a knock upside your head to get you to understand something. So he was fascinated with the forbidden, ate the fruit. Is that what she did? Gave to her husband the Shekinah glory that was around them, meaning God had touched, watch this, had touched the earth and made them from dirt. Is that right? Adam was made from dirt. He was made from dirt, but God had to scoop it up. Is that right? That moment, his glorified hands touched the dirt. The dirt glowed. And when Adam and Eve were completed as human beings, they glowed. But when they sinned, the glow went out. And they both knew, the Bible said, they were naked. But out of that, they were naked. But they had the glory covered. And when they sinned, the glory went out. Boom, oops, what's that? You're naked. So they went into the trees and sold what? Fig leaves as aprons to cover themselves. That's when shame came. Sin came with shame. And shame came with sin. And there is shame today in sin. That's why people don't want to be found out. Is that right? Yeah. And when they found out, then they shame. Old folks used to say, ain't you got no shame? And that ought to be self-shame and you do not want to be shameful. Amen? And so the high, high concept here is we're struggling to be pure because we have a mind that's already defined. We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and we need to constantly be at that cross daily to get purified, to get cleansed, so we can face the day. You don't know what the devil is planning for you in a day. Is that right? Jesus told Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as me. How did the Lord know that? Because the Lord was in heaven and heard the conversation when the devil said, I got to get Peter. I'm just let me have Peter. Remember when Job was being tested? Before he got tested, Satan also came and he and God had a conversation. Job knew nothing about it. How do you know what a day brings? We don't. We got to walk by faith and not by sight. We got to walk every day by faith, believing in God, and then asking the Lord, give me a clean heart. Is that right? Lord, because I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy even to wake up and talk to you, but you bless me. You bless me. You bless me to wake up in the morning. You bless me to comb my hair. You bless me to have the activity of my limbs. Now, Lord, now, Lord, walk with me to the new job. Walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Walk with me through my doctor's appointments. Walk with me everywhere I go. Go before me. That's how you're going to stay pure. If you don't stay pure, my brothers and sisters, you will be defiled. And defiled means the devil will come upon you and get into your emotions and your appetite. Say emotions. And appetite. And you don't know what appetite you have until you see something. Is that right? I used to be fasting and I would go into the bank when it was Texas Bank down there. They'd be popping popcorn. That popcorn be smelling up the whole place. I said, I'm fasting today. They said, then you go out and do it. You want some popcorn? You got to be strong and say, no. Amen. Because you take it up. I need it up up there. Uh, you're not going to do that. Time you get there, something's going to fall out of the bag and you're going to help yourself. So you got to be strong enough to resist and strong enough to say, I'm going to walk with the Lord and I made up my mind. And then it takes a strong constitution. Blessed are the pure in heart. We don't get pure by thinking we're pure. We don't get pure by not sinning because the absence of sin is not necessarily purity. Is that right? Is that what the rich young ruler came to Jesus by day? At a time and ask him, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, you know the commandments, honor thy father and thy mother, and went on down the line. And he said, this I have done from my youth. Is that what he said? And when he said, now what would you have me do? He said, go sell all your goods. Give them to the poor. And he went away sad because he didn't want to make that, that leap. So just the absence of sin does not make you pure. It's the presence of Christ by faith that purifies you. Amen. You be the little old lady on the corner that uh, makes cookies and feeds all the cats. She can go to hell 
if she doesn't know Jesus as her Savior. Amen. Amen. That sounds hard, but that's the way it's written. Yeah. Oh God, if you're going to go to Christ, any man who will come under God, got to first come under Christ. Amen. Because yeah. without the Christ, it's impossible to please God. Yeah. So we got to come through it. Blessed, happy, divine are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now I want to say that a little more, and then we're going to go to another passage. I don't believe it's in the afterlife you see God when you get purified. I believe you can see God in the flowers that blossom. I believe you can see God in the people you deal with. I believe you can see God in the situations that he works out in your life, only for you. I believe you can hear God when he speaks to you in a still, small voice. I believe your character of faith determines your level of vision of God. All right, all right. And the lower your faith, the less you see. But the greater your faith, Amen. the more you Amen. see. Remember Abraham was told to leave Ur of the Chaldees. Leave your father, leave your mother, leave your house, and go to a place I'll take. Not many of us would get in our car and drive to Houston. But if God said get in your car and drive, we'd say where? And he'd say, I'll tell you when you get there. We say, ain't going. When you figure out where we're going, then you come back. Is that what we tell God? Like we know more than God. Abraham counted it, if you will, that God would lead him to the right place, and he left everything. And God said, because you believe me, I'm going to impute righteousness to you, and I'm going to bless you. Then Abraham took his only son and took a knife and put him on that altar because God said offer him as a sacrifice. And in obedience to God, he was ready to come down, and God said, no. Now that I see what you've done, I know you trust me. It's all about our mind. It's a battle for our mind. We've got to keep pure thoughts. We've got to dismiss rogue thoughts. And we've got to rebuke Satan daily. There is no way you can be pure and hope to be pure for a week if you can't be pure for a day. You cannot go for a week if you can't go for a day. And you can't go for a day until you go for an hour. And you can't go for an hour until you go for a minute. Come on! You gotta get it together. And it is a disciplined mind that God wants. He doesn't want an erratic mind like a grasshopper jumping from here to there, wanting some everything, like that a kid in the candy store. We want some of these and some of these and three of these and two of that. They buy they buy a lottery tickets like that now. Huh? You ever stand in front of and behind somebody, real use and real use like they're going to really win, and they lose. Then they back again. If you come to church, you might get blessed. If you come to bless, church, God might bless you and open up the windows and establish a stream of blessings. Hallelujah. Blessed are the pure in heart. What we think about us is the most important thing. And what we think about God that we will ever entertain. How we react to what we know about God is what God is judging us by. It's not whether you're poor or you're rich or you got a lot of money, you got a lot of intellect, you got this and that. That isn't anything. It, it's measured by do you believe what God is saying? And do you believe enough to act on it and to live by it? Because if you do, I'm going to bless you. Look at Job. Job had all the money, all the herds and flocks, all the servants, and in a day, lost everything. And he said, he, he, held, he held, the word is that he was patient. Patient is secondary. Job had integrity of mind. The story of Job is not one totally of patience. If it were patience, we could all get it. And we could just tie ourselves to something and say, I'm going to wait. But it was how he waited in his mind. He didn't falsely accuse God. He didn't try to deceive God or deceive anybody. He said, naked came I forth from my mother's womb, naked shall I return hither, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And then he broke out in boils and sores, and he said, if yet if the Lord slain me, I'm going to still trust him. Could you do that? When your friends say, oh, you sure look good. Come to see you in the hospital. Huh? Your hair haven't been washed. Huh? Your feet are looking bad. You look crusty. You feel like throwing something at me. Get out of here. They say, oh, you're ugly. Do you want somebody to come in like that? Do you at least want to say, baby, let me wash your hair? That's right. Is that right? Yes. That Job's friends came and looked at him and said, woo-wee. And then they sat there for several days without saying anything. You must have sinned. Tell us what you've done. Come on, man. You know you're lying by something. And 
said, I ain't done nothing. They said, you lying, because you, whoo, look how bad you look. Huh? I wouldn't want those visitors in my hospital room. Pick up a shoe, throw them out, get a fire hose and run them out, do something, get them out. Job said, yet will I trust God. That meant he had integrity of thought. Not integrity of snobbishness, integrity of thought. That his thought about God would remain unbroken. Like a lion. I will trust him. Do I have that rope up here? I sure like to use my rope when I come to that word integrity. Because it's such a wonderful thing. I don't think I had it took it. Anyway, if you think of a rope from one end of the building to the, across the other end, it would be stretched tight and pulled with tension in it. That's integrity. When you don't have integrity, you kind of let the rope drop because you lose your focus, dimension, and scope, and you don't have anywhere to go. But when you have a line that's tight all the way, that's your, that line represents your faith, your focus, your strength. And when you focus on God, he empowers you with strength. And when Job stayed focused on God, he got everything he lost back double, and he got his ten children. Ten new children. When Peter was walking on the water, is that right? It says, oh, they all got scared. It said, girls! And they sounded like 12-year-old girls at SeaWorld riding under those big rides. Uh, the Fiesta, Texas, riding iron snake or whatever it is. Ah! They said, and he said, Peter said, Lord, if it's thou, bids me come. And the Lord said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, I like this. And his face stretched like that rope, boom, right to Jesus. And when he saw it was Jesus and he heard the words of Jesus, he walked out on the word, at your word. And as he walked, H2O, soluble water, held up a 200 something pound man. Yeah. And he walked on it like I'm walking on this road. Mm -hmm. And he went on to go to Jesus. But he took his eyes off Jesus. And what happened? He started to sing. Integrity of thought could have held him up. And when the Lenemy got under the water, he said, Lord, help me, save me, I'm drowning. Got only a few minutes in cold sea water to live. After so much time, hypothermia sets in. Hypothermia makes you unconscious. When you're unconscious, you go under. When you go under, the water gets in your lungs. When it gets in your lungs, you die. All right? You don't have long to live. He said, Lord, help me. He was serious. Huh? Got you in a few seconds. Help me, Lord. And the Lord came immediately to him and lifted up. Wherefore, he, he rebuked him. Wherefore, why, why, you were walking, why did you doubt me? The only thing that caused you to sink was you went from faith to doubt. And when you went from faith to doubt, doubt took you down. When you were on faith, you were held up. And holding up is what God wants us to do. Hold it to your faith and depend it on his grace and he'll pull you up, he'll pull you in, he'll pull you out. God is able to do exceeding above above what we're able to think of. And let me hurry on to a close now. As we come to this part, blessed are the pure in heart, but they shall see God. And this brings us to Matthew 17. Because in Matthew 17, we get the transfiguration of Jesus. Everybody say transfiguration. transfiguration. Jesus changes in dimension and scope as he goes from earthly to spiritual. How do you know this? The Bible says after six days, he took Peter, James, and John to an exceeding high mountain. And the Bible says in the next verse at 17, and he was transfigured, are you following me? Yeah. Before them, and his face shined. Like what? It shined before them as the sun, and his raiment was as white as light. Can you imagine Jesus shining brightly, so brightly, they couldn't even look at him. Huh? He was bright 10,000 times brighter than this light. That was him in his glorified state. Amen? And the Lord said, as he was standing, sitting there, rather, then appeared unto him those who were previously dead. But God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So Moses and who? Elijah appeared with him. Is that what your Bible says? And he says, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah talking, having consciousness, having thought, and having a meaningful conversation 
from the eternity into time. Is this going to be something when you see your mother again? In a glorified state, talking you from an ethereal body that is glowing like the sun and glistening in power and glory. And it is the Shekinah glory of God. And she calls you by your name. And you say, Mom, may I know your son. I know your daughter. That's an awesome thing. When God transfigures you and he transfigures, just like that seed of okra, dead in the ground, but grew up to be alive and to give us more food. God can take your little life and though you lay in the ground and be buried in the ground and some don't forget you, your spirit is lifted up high into glory and God gives you a new body, a new walk, a new talk because you have purified yourself through the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing we could do could pay Jesus back. If we had 10,000 lifetimes, we couldn't thank him enough. When we get to glory and see how what God has in store, Jesus was transfigured, meaning his face came out like the sun and his clothes like white lightning. And that was an awesome transfiguration, and that is how we will be transfigured when the rapture of the church comes. We will go from a body that is temporal, limited, moving in space and time, to a spirit that can zoom at the faster than the speed of light. And speed of light is what? 170,000 miles per second. We will outrun the speed of light. Look at y'all still going. <laughs> we will be moving in a way that we never thought. Inhabiting the universe. We're going to struggle for purity. And it is a struggle. I'm going to pass this out. I may not have enough. My printer acted up. But here's what I want to say. I'll get this to you in a minute. Those whose hearts are purified by faith, who are not only sprinkled from the evil conscience by the blood of Jesus. In other words, every morning, Lord, purify my hands. Lord, cleanse my thoughts. Lord, let me breathe in salvation and exhale sin. Amen? Amen. You don't have to wait to exhale. You can exhale very well. And he says, you have your conscience sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, cleansed by the Spirit of God from, hear this, vain thoughts, unprofitable reasoning. You know, we can calculate with a genius IQ when we get ready to do some dirt. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go around and I'm going to sneak around through the way. Huh? And we go, I'm going to do this. You know how we get signified. So we have unreasonable thoughts. That's what's called unprofitable reasoning. Earthly and sensual desires. Is that right? If you allow those things to come in, they can corrupt you, make you addicted, and take you away from here. Huh? In a fallen state. Corrupt passions. Pure, and he says, who are purified from pride, self-will. And if we're not careful uh, and not purified, we'll get discontented. Is that right? Start kicking the dog and spitting in the goldfish bowl. Nobody likes me. Nobody called me mad. Have you ever been around somebody got mad for nothing? No, the Negro sitting up there getting mad. Nobody done nothing to you yet. Huh? But if you keep on talking like that, huh? I don't mean to get loud. But you know, anger, malice, envy, covetousness, ambition, all of these things begin into your heart and begin to defile you. One thought can defile you. You ever had a foul thought? You say, oh, that's too foul. The devil say, oh, come on. You say, really? The devil can lure you with a thought, but the devil never forces you. Watch me. The devil never takes your arm, twists it, and make you do something. Now tell me you deaf. No, he doesn't. He suggests. He has the power of suggestion, and he has flashback in your memory. He has distorted reasoning, and he always, most of the time, worked through the eye gate or the memory gate if you've already seen. What you see, you can want, and what you want is something you shouldn't want. Right. Amen? Amen? So the devil works through the eye gate, the ear gate, the memory gate, the touch gate, the taste gate, right. huh? and any kind of gate he can get through. So you got to pray in the morning, close all them gates, right. so the devil won't get through. Be careful little children say, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little mouth what you say. Is that right? Be careful little hand what you touch. Be careful little feet or size 12s where you go. Amen. Amen? 
Because there's a father up above looking down with us. Jesus was transfigured in that moment. His raiment changed, his features changed, and then those who came from beyond death, they came from the world of the spirit, conversed and talked with him. How did, what did they say? The Bible doesn't tell us what they said. But Peter said, Lord, there was Peter, James, and John. They saw Moses and Elijah. And those men were dead five, six hundred years before they were born. How did they know? Because Peter said, Lord, do you want to, it's good that we should be here. Should we build tabernacles, booths, for, for Moses and Elijah and you? And at that moment, at that moment when he interrupted the conversation, at that moment when he spoke from an earthly body, a glorious, beautiful cloud, glistening with white and gold, Bible says, overcame them all and said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. That was God of glory. And he was in a glorified state. And they got so afraid of that cloud overtaking them, that mist and that beautiful sparkle, they fell and the Bible says they were S-O-R-E, sore, very deeply afraid. And then when the Lord came, he touched them. And the cloud was gone. And, she, and Moses and Elijah were gone. And he said, see that you tell no man this until after I told God has something inside of you that you and I can't see. It's called a soul and a spirit. You got a body. We all know your body, man. And if you stay around here long enough, your body will get old. If you stay around here long enough, black hair will turn gray. If you stay around here long enough, all riders will catch But when you get to glory, you'll shed the old and take the new. And God's power will transform you completely from what you were to what you never thought you could be. And you'll be in a glorified state. The state that Adam and Eve lost will have been gained back by the cross of Jesus Christ. What he lost, what Adam lost on a tree, Jesus came and died on a tree and claimed it back. What was lost in the garden of Eden was found in the garden of his God brought it back through Jesus Christ. You got to struggle. But if you can't struggle a minute, you can't make an hour. If you can't struggle an hour, you can't make a day. If you can't struggle a day, you won't make a week. So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a destiny. God wants you to start with the thought of righteousness. Have be good thoughts.